And you had an intriguing bit about making the distinction between uh, uh, wicked problems and tame problems. Mm. Could you explain that a little bit and how one makes that the decision? Because I gather what you're saying is if it's a tame problem, don't overreact. Mm -hmm. If it's a wicked, wicked problem, you better get moving. Sure. Well, I mean, it's... Uh, what would be a wicked a, problem, for example? Well, climate change would be a, <laughs> <That's> a big <laughs> one. Yeah. Uh, but again, it's a distinction which, uh, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a kind of dichotomy which has existed in social science for, you know, three or four decades. Right. I didn't invent it up. Uh, but uh, the idea is that, you know, uh, there are some problems which are easily solvable uh, if you put enough resources uh, into solving them. And you know when you have solved the problem because the results are clear and you know, you know when to stop. Uh, there are also then wicked problems which are of a completely different nature. You do not know when you have solved it, even if you did. Uh, they usually, you know, your solutions then uh, produce their own problems, which often make the problem worse. And uh, it's very hard to actually zoom in on the problem because often it's part of a much larger, broader set of uh, you know, social political uh, problems, right? So uh, to me, the reason why I sort of zoom in on this dichotomy is because uh, authoritarianism uh, probably is a wicked problem, not a tame one. So we should not expect that by designing tools to circumvent internet censorship, we would necessarily uh, undermine uh, authoritarian regimes worldwide. And there is still this assumption that all that's missing in Russia or China is access to information. The moment we build those tools, people will use them to download you know, uh, information accusing their governments of human rights abuses, and uh, they will all rise up. And I think uh, that's not going to happen. And uh, I spent a chapter looking actually at how some of these regimes have recognized that uh, entertainment uh, is one of the most popular uh, activities online, and they actually are often... What's the one in Russia, a whole service on breasts? Um, yes, it's one of the uh, most entertaining bits, I think, in the book, where uh, a Russian, well, a Russian MP, basically, he is now Rikov. a member of parliament, Rikov, yeah. who is uh, the godfather of the Russian internet. Uh, uh, who's been online probably for you know 18 years, who's been overseeing all possible projects and eventually emerged as the Kremlin's top man on all things digital. Uh, he runs a number of new media projects. One of them is uh, internet television called Russia.ru. And uh, one of their programs there is, uh, you know, is based on a very simple idea of a very young and horny and slightly overweight young man who basically goes to uh, various nightclubs in Moscow uh, searching for the perfect uh, female breasts. And uh, he does it program, every week. It? It's very popular. Mm. It's, you know, it's all produced. Uh, it's probably the most popular program, actually, on that, uh, on that website. And occasionally, they would throw in you know, interviews with Medvedev, or you know some ideological propaganda on that website as well, right. but the attraction is the entertainment. Um, and uh, to me, it's initiatives like this which I think show that the governments are very, uh, you know, they they don't view the internet as an enemy, and they are surrounded, especially in the case of Russia, they are surrounded by very smart uh, advisors, many of whom uh, know the Russian internet way better than anyone working for the opposition. Um, and of course, they try to set up all sorts of you know, social and, and, and political traps uh, for the Russian young people, many of whom uh, end up on those websites and you know, never leave. Let me ask you a question about Belarus, because it seems, looking from afar, uh, that this is a real sort of oddity uh, because of where it is. Uh, it's in Europe, yes. and at least for the current period of time, there is no authoritarian problem with the use of internet and other tools except in Belarus. And they've been very successful so mm -hmm. far. What, what do you attribute this to and how long is it gonna last? Well, I mean, the nature, <coughs> sorry, the nature of the regime uh, has very little to do with uh, its ability to use the internet. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, uh, for a very long time, uh, he's, you know, uh, Lukashenko has just been genuinely popular. Right. Uh, you know, he comes from the masses. You know, he was uh, 
a high school teacher in a village. You know, he has he identifies. Uh, was the he may be forms. popular, but he had to fix um, the last election again, didn't he? He, he, he did. Again, you know, it's uh, he, it's tricky, mm. <laughs> you know, and it's and it's very tricky in a sense that he knows how to play the West and Russia off each other, and uh, he's been getting money from both up until you know the last election, and I think his bet was that uh, Russia probably has more to offer at this point. Uh, and so he almost broke off all relations with the EU right. um, and with America and uh, again made up with Russia. Um, uh, you know, the interesting thing is that there is very little internet filtering in Belarus. Uh, no websites are banned. Uh, you can go and browse anything you want. Uh, the government very strategically, um, for example, on the day of the elections, they did not shut down the entire internet the way uh, Mubarak did. What they did was just to disable certain internet protocols. Uh, so uh, HTTPS, <coughs> the secure sort of HTTP protocol, which you need to access your, in some cases, email. So to access your Gmail, you do need this protocol. They just banned it, so you could not get on social media because of that. Right. The rest of the internet seemed to be working fine, but you could not get online on, on your Gmail. And many of the um, websites of the opposition uh, and of the independent media uh, were also under cyber attacks. So no one could actually go and visit them either. And their backup plan was that if they become targets of cyber attacks, they would start sending out emails uh, to their subscribers and inform them of what's happening by email. And of course, all of them set up accounts on Gmail. And because that protocol was down, they couldn't actually log in and inform their subscribers either. So in a sense, the independent publishers were caught off guard completely. Um, but now there are reports that the government is actually asking uh, mobile phone companies, the operators of the mobile networks in Belarus, uh, for information about anyone uh, of their subscribers who showed up on the square to protest the outcome of the election. Because you can actually trace uh, all mobile phones because they all have to connect to a tower. Mm -hmm. uh, the government actually uh, and, and we didn't know whether the government actually is getting that data and going through it or is just spreading these rumors to intimidate people, right. which again is a popular tactic. You know, it doesn't really matter whether the government have that capability. What matters is them uh, spreading the rumors to intimidate people. So again, they do show some sophistication, um, you know, and, and, and the litter has been uh, just much smarter than many people in the West assumed. He has been very strategically playing off, as I said, Russia and, and America and the EU against each other. Let me ask you one. And it's very hard to. to, 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 to a little bit more longer smart. range question, yes. then we're going to go to the audience. So uh, I hope you've got some questions out there. Uh, 